Okay. Then moving to today's speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Benson Amron. Sarah's on the faculty at the University of Wyoming, based in Laramie, but she's out here in the Bay Area for a year, more or less on sabbatical leave and working on some other projects for a short time. Um, I first got to know Sarah when she got out here this fall and contacted me about wanting to integrate with Behavior Group here a little bit. And we're certainly happy to have you here and welcome and interact with the museum in any way you want. But Sarah got her undergrad degree at Cornell in neurobiology and behavior, so good start, that's what my undergrad um, She then went on to get her PhD at Michigan State. So Michael and I are both out of Ann Arbor, we have to, you know, hustle <laughs> there, but up the road at Michigan State, where she worked primarily with Kay Holtkamp. Kay is well known here to many of us for her work on hyenas over the years. Um, and that was, I think, the launching point for some of the themes and questions that we'll hear about today in a variety of animals. After completing her PhD in 2011, Sarah moved and did a postdoc at St. Andrews University for several years before starting her current position in Wyoming. So conceptually, Sarah's program, which obviously she'll explain better than I will, but focuses on animal cognition, and in particular, response to varying types of environmental variation. It could be the social environment, short-term environmental change, in some sense longer-term anthropogenic change now as well. So things like problem solving, social learning, personality, and a variety of questions like that, both in natural and captive settings. And although I think those of you who know Sarah's work first think of her in hyenas and things like that, She's actually not going to talk so much about carnivores today. She's giving a wildlife lunch on October 5th, and we'll talk about the carnivores there. Today, the taxonomic focus is going to be a little bit different. Zebra finches, um, and you'll hear more about that in a second. I think the last thing to say, other than again welcome, is somewhere I had the fun facts that Lelania always requests. So, fun facts about Sarah. I'll read, I once sat on a wild, very much awake hyena to remove a can that was stuck on its head. And I was surrounded by a circle of Maasai during this incident. So one of those on-the-spot teaching moments, right? Okay. Field biology. Her second fun fact is, I discovered that in my experience, the one thing that a hyena would not eat is 10-day-old unrefrigerated meat. <laughs> Thus, my dissertation experiments made me very confident in my decision to be a vegetarian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. With that, I'll turn it over to Sarah and let her tell us about her work. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for the kind invitation uh, to speak. I'm really excited to be here to tell you about some of the work I have going on in my lab at the University of Wyoming. Um, so. As Eileen just said, uh, typically a lot of my work is focused on carnivores and thinking about um, ecological influences on cognitive abilities. Uh, my prior work was mostly with spotted hyenas, uh, and my current lab has a, a raccoon project that's now sort of morphed into a meso-carnivore project, particularly focusing on urban carnivores and how cognition might facilitate adaptation to <coughs> urban environments. And so currently we're studying um, captive and wild populations of raccoons, skunks, and coyotes. And uh, I will get into all of that work in more detail in the Fisheries and Wildlife Seminar in a couple of weeks. Um, so if you're interested, uh, please come to that. And I'm sorry I'm not, I don't have time to get into that today. Uh, but we also uh, have some work in my lab on Asian elephants as well, which I won't have time to talk about, but I'm happy to chat about with anyone who's interested. Uh, just to give you a little preview, like we're at the movies, and this is the preview of future films. Um, some of the work we're doing right now is trying to get automated um, puzzle boxes or sort of feeders to test, in this case, reversal learning um, in these miso carnivores with the idea that we can put them out in the field and it will automatically identify the animal that's approaching it and then present them with the, the appropriate test for that animal. So that's something we've done in captivity and we're now moving into the field this season. And again, I'll talk about that work in detail um, Fisheries and Wildlife Seminar. And then another um, area of research in my lab that I unfortunately don't have time to get into too much detail on today is work that we've done on the evolution of um, cognitive abilities, in particular problem solving abilities uh, within carnivores. So in this project we had a very large comparative study 
where we tested 153 individuals from all of these species represented here, so 41 species uh, from nine families within the order of carnivora, um, and we presented them with this novel problem-solving problem -solving task and asked, does relative brain size predict uh, performance on this task? And it does. Um, so this is, again, work that I'll talk about more um, in that fisheries and wildlife talk. But for today, uh, I want to tell you about other work that we have in my lab, a separate project we have going on investigating uh, individual and social influences on problem solving abilities. And for this work, we're using a very different study system of zebra finches. So zebra finches are really great for these types of questions that we're interested in asking because they're um, a model system, so we know a lot about them from various aspects of their behavior and genetics, um, communication, et cetera. So it has a, it, there's a great base of there um, for building our study system on. Um, and then also for us, they're monogamous. And so they form these monogamous pairs. They have relatively low levels of extra pair fraternity in the wild. And for our purposes, they uh, are pretty easily kept in captivity and they readily breed in captivity. So they make a great system um, for the types of questions we're asking. And I'm going to tell you about a few different projects we have with the zebra finches. The first was work done with uh, Neil Chibuger, Tom Morgan, and Kevin Leland out of the University of St. Andrews, um, where we asked whether pair bonds help individuals to coordinate their behavior and pool different skills to solve complex problems. Uh, this work was inspired by the field's uh, research in collective decision making, where in recent years there's been an intense interest using both theoretical and empirical approaches and in trying to understand how groups of animals make coordinated decisions um, to elucidate factors that um, lead to animals taking leadership roles in these different situations, and also to try and understand how animals can synchronize their behavior. And so as we know, groups of animals often have to coordinate their behavior and make communal decisions. And leaders and followers can frequently emerge during these collective actions. And um, <coughs> leaders can be those individuals with the most relevant knowledge at a particular period in time. So if you think about um, uh, matriarchs in African elephant societies leading families to watering holes that they visited in the past. Um, however, it's unlikely in many scenarios that only one individual will have all of the relevant knowledge for these scenarios at all times. And in fact, it's, it's quite possible that different individuals will possess relevant knowledge at any given time. And so we would expect um, in those situations that individuals might switch between leading and following depending on their knowledge state. We know that humans are very good at this, they're very good at switching between leading and following, um, and they're also very good at pooling. Uh, different individuals that have might have relevant knowledge to answer a complex, or in this case, a fairly simple question. Um, but we don't know in non-human animals how pervasive this is, um, and because it hasn't been studied very extensively. And so, for this project, we use the term skill pooling to mean when individuals with different skills or knowledge combine those skills or that knowledge um, to generate a novel solution to a problem. So in a human example, you can think of artisans that are skilled um, in different areas uh, that together um, can produce a novel tool or weapon. When we think about non-human animals, it's harder to, to come up with relevant examples, but one possible example of this might be migration. So you can think about situations in which animals are migrating across distances reliably from one location to another. And there might not be just one individual in that group that has the knowledge uh, necessary to make that entire migration route successfully, but in fact, individuals might trade off in terms of um, when they're knowledgeable and when they're naive. So <clears throat> in this study, we asked, do we see evidence for skill pooling in zebra finches? And in particular, we had three main questions. First, can pairs of foraging zebra finches combine their incomplete knowledge to solve a multi-step problem? or a foraging task in this case. Do zebra finches switch between leading and following depending on their knowledge state? And does the strength of the social relationship between partners affect performance on this task? So to do this um, experiment, we, we came up with a novel maze task for the zebra finches. So here we would place pairs in a starting compartment, and they would have to 
go through here are holes um, through partitions. They'd have to pass through a hole, pass through another hole, and access food. And so we had three um, treatment conditions. We had train train pairs. So in this situation, uh, one individual, let's say uh, in this case the female, is trained to go through a, a blue square hole. Um, we trained all individuals with a partner, so in this case uh, same sex, conspecific. Um, so these two females learn to go through a blue square. And then as they learn this, um, that this is you know, a helpful thing to do to access food, we then gave them <coughs> smaller um, holes that differ in their shape and their color. So now we have a blue square and a purple hexagon and we block this with a plastic film. So they learn they can pass through blue and not through purple. Uh, likewise with the male, in this case, um, th these guys are trained to go through a red circle and then we train them to go through the red circle and not the green star. So in this case, one individual in the pair is trained on this first partition, the second individual is trained on the second partition. So each individual has partial knowledge of the problem. Together they have complete knowledge of the problem. We also had control pairs where these birds were housed in, very, in identical conditions, but they weren't presented with partitions um, before testing. And then we had trained control pairs where one individual in the pair is trained on one of the dividers, the other individual is a control bird, um, and we pseudo-replicated. So females and males were trained equally on the first versus the second partition and, um, um, and on the different uh, colors. So we had some birds trained on the red circle and some birds trained to go through the green star, for example. Okay, so as I said, for the train train pairs, we would expect, if they're skill pooling, that, uh, that one, the bird that's trained, let's say the female in this case, uh, goes to the first partition. Um, so you can see this in animation. So she goes, she leads through her first partition because she knows that uh, decision and then waits and then the male should lead through the second and the female should follow and they should both find the food. So to go through all of our predictions, we expected that our training would work. So we expected that the trained pairs should do better than the trained control and the control pairs, that the trained birds would lead when faced with their trained partition, and we expected that pair bonded birds should do better on this task than pairs of familiar conspecifics. In this case, the familiar conspecifics were housed together for the same amount of time as the pair bonded birds. Um, we had same sex pairs of familiar conspecifics, so female-female and male-male. Um, so they were very familiar with each other but not bonded. So 32 pair bonded birds, 64 familiar males, and 24 familiar females. And we found that uh, our training worked, so that's always helpful uh, when you're doing these studies to know that what you're doing is effective. So um, here's our percent of successful individuals, and our trained pairs do significantly better than the other two conditions, so that's helpful. Uh, trained birds were also less neophobic, so neophobia is a fear of novel things, and in this case it was measured by their latency to make the first decision, to pass through the first partition. So birds that are less afraid should move through the first partition faster than birds that are more afraid. And we found that the trained birds moved significantly faster through the partitions than, than did the um, control birds. <coughs> We also found that um, when faced with the partition that they were trained on, the trained birds chose correctly and took the lead. So here is the percent of trained individuals when faced with the partition that they were trained on. Uh, so almost 80% of the time they led through that partition and made the correct decision. Less than 20% <coughs> of the time they followed um, but still made the correct decision. And then they very rarely made the wrong decision, either leading or following. So, so far our first two predictions are met. Um, now if we look at the effect of social relationship on performance in this task, we find that as predicted, the pair bonded birds do significantly better. Um, so pair bonded birds were much more successful. This goes for both uh, results on an individual level and also for trials in which only both individuals found the food. Um, so pair bonded birds still do significantly better than pairs of same sex familiar conspecifics. This is not just due to a sex difference. If you look at the performance of pair bonded birds, so male-female pairs compared to male-male and female-female pairs of familiar conspecifics, uh, the pair bonded birds do better and the um, same-sex conspecifics are performing fairly equivalently to each other. 
We also found that the monogamous pairs were less neophobic uh, and made the faster decisions, just like the trained pairs. Um, and likewise, that they find the food faster. They're just generally solving the problem faster than the pairs of familiar and conspecific. So based on these results, it does appear that these zebra finches are able to pool their incomplete knowledge to solve this problem, and that pair bonding um, is very helpful in, in terms of performance on this task. We then did a follow-up uh, analysis using some Bayes Bayesian modeling um, to look at our data in more detail. And so here we, we constructed a model where a bird's success can be affected by the following factors. One, just the baseline value. Two, the effect of being trained. Three is the effect of having a trained partner. And this can interact with whether or not you're in a pair bond. So in other words, um, pair bonded birds can be more or less um, influenced by having a trained partner. Uh, an interaction between being trained yourself and having a trained partner. Uh, this again interacts with whether or not you're in a pair bond. Just the general effect of being in a pair bond. An effect of sex that again interacts with being in a pair bond. Uh, and then a random effect of pair. So this accounts for the fact that individuals, an individual bird's success may be contingent on um, that of their partner. So we ran this model, and we found that the following parameters were removed from the model, showing that they did not have a significant effect on um, problem-solving performance. And these were the effects of sex, the effects of having a trained partner, and this main interaction between being trained and having a trained partner. So uh, this tells us that, as our previous results showed, there is this strong effect of being trained. So if you're trained on the task, you perform better than if you're not. Um, not surprising and nice to see the confirmation. However, the lack of any effect of having to have a of having a trained partner makes us wonder if this isn't actually if the results we're seeing aren't actually due to skill pulling. So perhaps um, these animals in the trained trained pairs are just doing better due to the training and not their own training and not due to any influence of their partner's training. This is work that we're still writing up for publication. So if you have any ideas on uh, how else to explain these results, I'm all ears. But um, it makes us question how much of what we're seeing is actually, in fact, due to skill pulling. Uh, the analyses also confirm to us that pair bonding is um, incredibly important for success on this task. And so if you look at the numbers, you can see that in untrained birds, uh, the probability of success when you're not in a pair bond is very low. Uh, and it's moderate if you're in a pair bond and you're untrained. If you're trained um, but you're unbonded, your success is equivalent, equivalently moderate, um, and it's very high if you're in a pair bond. So what this, saying is, what is, this is saying is that there's actually no difference between bonded untrained birds and trained unbonded birds, which suggests that the effect of being in a pair bond is as important as the effect of being trained to solve this task, which I think is really interesting. It shows us how um, how critical the the influence of being with your mate is on performance in this type of task. Uh, and I, I was surprised by how strong that um, result was. So in conclusion for this one study, we found that um, Increased problem-solving abilities may be a fairly um, important but overlooked benefit of pair bonding. And this study, I think, offers some valuable empirical support for models of collective decision-making, which um, showing that, basically, uh, complex group behaviors can result from the uh, interactions of individuals following fairly simple rules. Uh, now we are furthering this work by trying to understand why pair bonds are so important and how, how they help animals to solve these types of problems. And so all of these are not mutually exclusive hypotheses, but what we're investigating right now is whether we do in fact see enhanced social learning between mates. So I'll tell you about that study next. We're also examining um, personality compatibility between partners and what effects that might have on performance in these types of tasks. Um, we're also starting to try and look at uh, vocal communication of birds when they're going through these tasks and looking at synchrony between mates. Um, and then another idea that we have is to look at stress levels of birds going through these mazes when they're with their mate versus a familiar conspecific. Um, so that's work we'd like to do but have not yet um, 
had a chance to do. So first I want to tell you about uh, one more study, which is uh, looking at social learning. So this study was done with Chris Templeton, Catherine Phillip, Lauren Gillette, and Kevin Leyland at the University of St. Andrews, uh, and where we asked whether sex and pairing status impact how zebra finches use social information. So social learning, for anyone who might not know, is acquiring information from observing another individual. And it's ubiquitous throughout uh, the animal kingdom. We know how important social information can be to many different animal species. However, social information is often less reliable than information you gain yourself. And so there's a lot of theory out there trying to explain um, when you should use socially acquired information versus personally acquired information and who you should gain information from, so who you should copy uh, to increase the reliability of information that you're getting. Uh, some ideas include demonstrator, sex, or age, so depending on the species, perhaps females or males might be more reliable <coughs> depending on a particular problem. Um, likewise, perhaps adults are more reliable at giving information than juveniles. Uh, also, there's evidence that uh, perhaps you should acquire information from higher ranking individuals versus lower ranking individuals, um, and that you should acquire information from animals that you're familiar with. Um, but if you keep the level of familiarity constant in terms of time spent together, then do animals preferentially copy a mate versus a familiar individual? And so that's what uh, we wanted to look at in this study, which I think has some wide implications as we know social monogamy occurs in many animals, um, but we don't yet know how much pair bonds actually promote social learning between mates. So in this study we asked, are zebra finches more likely to copy the foraging decisions of their mate compared to a familiar conspecific? And so to do this, we paired birds. Uh, we let them stay together for 10 days until they exhibited strong clumping behaviors um, and other pairing behaviors. And particularly, we waited until males built nests and females um, began to lay eggs in those nests. Uh, we also had pairs of familiar conspecifics. This is different than the previous study. These are now um, male-female pairs of familiar conspecifics. So they're separated by a partition, they can see each other, they can hear each other, uh, but they can't actually touch each other. So this prevents bonding between these birds, but they are kept together for the same amount of time. We then wanted to ask whether, when presented with two novel feeders um, that differ in their um, visual properties, uh, whether they would select the feeder that their mate was feeding on more than they select the feeder that a uh, familiar conspecific was feeding from. And so um, zebra finches are, use color uh, pretty strongly, and uh, we think that color is quite important to them. So we wanted to get away from any biases associated with different colored feeders. Perhaps they just like red more than they like blue. Uh, so we use vertical stripes and horizontal black and white stripes as our two feeders. And we first wanted to ask, um, are there any biases even with these vertical versus horizontal stripes? So we said, do these birds have an underlying pattern for one preference, uh, underlying preference for one pattern versus the other? So to do this, um, we put them in, uh, we basically wallpapered their cages. So this bird has vertically striped wallpaper, this bird has horizontally striped wallpaper, and we remove this divider in the middle, and then we say, where do they spend the most time? And um, we found that these birds explored both sides, um, but all of them showed a very strong preference. Not the same preference, some preferred vertical, some preferred horizontal, but it was a very strong preference. Uh, spending almost, eight, well about 78% of their time on one side versus the other. So given this, given that we know they have this strong preference, um, we then trained their demonstrator on the non-preferred pattern. So if a male prefers vertical stripes, we trained his mate to feed from the horizontally striped feeder. So if he copies her decision, he's going to his non-preferred feeder. Sorry, I don't know why um, this is being loud. But yes, so uh, you can see that um, we had basically, in this case, a female feeding, in this case from the vertically striped feeder. Uh, the male is over here watching uh, through a mesh partition. And then when her uh, demonstration is over, we remove her, we pull the partition, and we give the male a chance to choose between those two feeders. <coughs> um, so here, 
you can see that in action. Uh, and the male will go and select one of the two feeders uh, to feed from. In this case, he's actually choosing the non-demonstrated feeder. Okay, so we ask, um, basically, do these mated birds preferentially choose the feeder that their mate demonstrates versus the one they're a familiar conspecific demonstrated? And we expected that, um, basically, that they would. So here we have our um, familiar uh, birds, and we found that familiar birds do change their preference and copy uh, the feeder that the uh, opposite sex demonstrator uh, showed fed from. Uh, and likewise, paired females copy their mate's feeding location. It's um, not significantly different from these other treatments. Uh, so we do see that they're copying, but not significantly more so than the, um, than the de feeder demonstrated by the familiar conspecific. However, males do the opposite. So paired males actually avoided the feeder that uh, was demonstrated to them. Typical. So we found, <laughs> we found this very puzzling. We tried to think of explanations, and the only explanation we could come up with, which I warn you is very anthropomorphic, is that basically they're acting chivalrously. So we <laughs> tested them during a period of egg laying where the female is... Um, has a need, a greater need for food resources than the male does. Um, and so we wanted to look at this in a situation in which they were feeding simultaneously and not consecutively. So we ran a follow-up experiment where we had the birds in a joint foraging context. So here we had a separate group of paired birds um, that were in their egg laying stage. We had 18 pairs, and we video recorded them feeding for 20 minutes. And to make sure that they had a limited, super yummy food to feed from, we gave them cucumber. Who knew cucumber is like the, you know, particularly the desired food of these zebra finches? <laughs> so we took a tiny little piece of cucumber, we put it in the cage, and we said, who eats it? Um, that is the tiny little piece of cucumber. <laughs> okay. So we said, do males defer feeding opportunities to females in this joint foraging context? Uh, and we found, first of all, that there was no difference in terms of discovery of the food. So both males and females discover the cucumber in the same amount of time. Um, when they discover the food, though, females eat it uh, and males don't. And this is despite the fact that they would happily eat it without that female there. Um, so paired males do defer this feeding opportunity to their partner um, during the egg laying stage, even in, uh, in sort of real time in a joint foraging context. Unfortunately, we could not test the opposite um, sex pairs of familiar conspecifics in this context because the males just chase the females around because they're not bonded <coughs> to each other. Um, so that would, I think, really drive the point home if we found that there, there wasn't this deferring of resources in that context. But with this experimental setup, we couldn't test that uh, condition. So if you also, if you uh, have any other ideas about how to interpret these results, uh, <coughs> I'm very interested in hearing that as well. Uh, for us, the, the next obvious step is to uh, basically test these birds not during egg laying, but during other times in the breeding cycle and see if these results hold or if it's only during this particularly nutritionally demanding egg laying phase. Um, and so that's the next step that we're pursuing, but haven't, we don't have data on that yet. So in conclusion for this study, we do see that zebra finches use social information to make foraging decisions, but not all individuals use this information in the same way. And the demonstrator, the identity of the demonstrator is really important, and the relationship of the observer and the demonstrator is really important. Um, and paired males avoided competing with their mate for food during the egg laying stage. So we do think that in this context, males are, uh, male zebra finches are appearing to act uh, chivalrously. So uh, to follow up on the initial skill pooling results, we are also now looking at personality and how it relates to problem solving abilities and how the personality of a pair, um, the compatibility of different personalities can influence joint problem solving. So this is a work that we currently have going on in my lab at the University of Wyoming. 
Um, this is being led by my PhD student, Lisa Barrett, uh, by an undergraduate student, Jessica Marsh, and uh, my collaborators, Neil Chibogert and Chris Templeton. So, uh, as most of you I'm, I'm guessing know, animal personality is defined as behavioral differences that are consistent, um, behavioral differences between individuals that are consistent across uh, contexts and across time. And recent uh, recent work in the field of animal behavior has shown the profound um, implications that animal personality can have on a variety of different um, behaviors. And uh, animal personality can be sort of an individual personality trait, or we can also think of them as linked to personality traits, more of a behavioral syndrome. And um, in thinking about animal personality, one example might be um, how individuals might differ on a shy, bold axis. So you can imagine situations in which Let's say a stickleback um, is really hungry and wants food, but there's a predator present, so it would avoid it. Uh, in another, in the same situation, another stickleback um, would actually uh, approach that food because it is more willing to take risks in that situation. We would call that a bolder individual. Um, so, animal personality has been shown to have implications for fitness across a number of different species in a number of different contexts. It's been linked to dispersal tendency, group dynamics, mate choice, um, and even cognitive ability in some respects. Within zebra finches, we have some evidence of personality um, from the literature as well as some links to cognition, but we really don't know whether or not individual personality influences problem-solving performance. Uh, on a range of tasks and um, how important that is for the species. So in this next study, we wanted to ask, does personality predict problem-solving performance? Um, and if so, which personality traits are, are the most important? Uh, so we first asked, do we find traits that are repeatable across time um, in these zebra finches that would indicate personality? Uh, and then we looked at whether or not we find evidence for different personality traits influencing problem-solving abilities. Um, specifically, you can imagine certain predictions, like bolder individuals should solve tasks, should solve tasks faster than shyer individuals. Uh, so in this study, we had 41 zebra finches, 20, males and, um, 20 females and 21 males. We ran a series of different personality assessments. So one was general activity. So here we basically just asked, how much do birds fly around? Um, in, a, in a cage in a given amount of time. Uh, we also looked at neophobia or boldness, so we presented them with novel objects that they hadn't seen before, <laughs> Thomas, the, Thomas the Train or a yellow crop. We said, how long does it take them to feed next to this novel object um, to measure boldness? And we had a, a number of different objects that we showed to them. Uh, we also looked at aggression using mirror pecs, so we presented them with uh, a mirror and asked um, basically how much do they interact with that mirror assuming that they think that that's a, a different individual not themselves so we're assuming some intelligence but not a lot of intelligence <laughs> um, and you can see this is one example of a fairly aggressive zebra finch in that scenario um, and then we also looked at within group interactions so we looked at dominance over a single feeder in a group setting uh, these guys we painted all of their heads with pet safe paint so we could tell them apart from the top uh, without being able to see leg bands. Okay, and then we presented them with a series of uh, problem solving tasks. So we had um, three different tests that we gave them. Um, e they had 30 minute trials with each test, and we looked at do they solve the test? How long does it take them to touch it? How long does it take them to solve it? Um, and actually, the time they spend actually working on the task versus being distracted, um, things like that. And so here's just one video of a, of a bird solving the string pull task. So they first have to inhibit this response to just straight for the food. Uh, these are the tips figure two. And they then have to figure out they have, that they have to go to the side and pull the string to get the food out. Um, this is the wire pull task. Again, they have to inhibit this initial response, just peck at the glass. Uh, and learn that they have to pull out the wires in order to create a big enough <laughs> hole for them to stick their head in into this and get food. Uh, and here is the uh, lid removal task. So you can see they take a, a variety of approaches to actually get this lid off. Uh, some of it's just pecking. Some birds actually just pick the whole thing up and fly away with it. 
So we saw <laughs> quite a diversity of behaviors when interacting with these and different solution types. Okay. So first we ask, is there evidence for personality um, in these birds? And we do see that dominance was repeatable across 10 trials. Uh, our measure of boldness as well. Uh, same thing with activity. Same thing with persistence. Um, and so we do see some evidence that um, in these measures, which we're able to look at uh, repeatedly, there, there is evidence of um, consistent individual differences across time. I should say that one very classic measure of personality is exploratory behavior. And we've tried very diligently with our zebra finches to get them to do some of these classic tests where you have a new room and you have these artificial trees in the room and you see how many of the artificial trees they touch in a given period of time. Um, and zebra finches just won't do it. <laughs> they just hunker down and stay put. And we've tried everything uh, to get them to move around this room and they just won't do it. So we don't have that classic measure to compare our results to yet. Um, but we're working on it. I think I have an idea for how to get them to do it using nest boxes and nesting material instead of artificial trees. So stay tuned. Um, but we also uh, have, this is, these data are hot off the presses. So these are all individual personality traits that we've looked at at this point. Um, but we're now doing a more um, like principal component approach to look at the data all together and to see are there any sort of more um, general personality axes that might um, be going on in the species that might predict problem solving success. <coughs> so in terms of just looking at related personality traits so far, we see some indication that activity and boldness may be related. So birds that are um, more active are also um, bolder, uh, as you can see here. So here's our average latency to feed, so boldness. So if you are bolder, then you're down here, whereas if you're shyer, you're up here. And our average activity is basically how much they move through their home enclosure. Um, so we see some evidence that these traits may be correlated, um, but it's still weak evidence. And so, but those are the only correlated traits we found thus far. And in terms of problem solving success, we found that um, we see quite a bit of variation across um, individuals and in how many tasks they're able to solve. So some birds weren't able to solve any. Some birds were able to solve all three, but the majority fell in uh, one or two of the different tasks. All of the tasks were presented in the same order to each bird, um, which will come into play in a second. We do see some interesting sex differences. So um, females tended to be more successful on the tasks than uh, males, at least in the wire and the lid flipping task, uh, not in the string pulling task. So um, I'm not sure how to interpret those results yet, but something to and we do see that boldness influenced um, string pulling success. So bolder birds were more successful at this task. String pulling was our first task that they saw. So it's possible that they, that more neophobic birds were less successful in the first situation, but then they may be habituated to the testing overall. And so neophobia was less important for later tasks uh, because boldness was only, uh, was only important for string pulling and not the other tasks. Uh, in terms of sex, uh, I'm sorry, in terms of wire removal, um, sex was the main predictor variable um, for problem solving success in that task. And then in terms of lid flipping, we found that persistence played a strong role. Lid flipping was our most difficult task, and it was the last one that they had. So it's possible that on the more difficult tasks, we see that persistence comes into play, whereas when the tasks were easier, persistence wasn't as much of a factor. Um, in terms of overall predictors of problem solving success of three problems, we found that on average persistence does pay off in terms of if you're able to solve all three tasks versus only uh, one or two or none. Um, but no other personality traits that we measured so far have shown uh, a, a strong link to problem solving success. So as I mentioned, we're following up on these initial analyses by looking at this as in a more multivariate approach. Um, so we'll see if that informs these results at all. And then we're also now running these personality assessments um, again. So it's been about six months since we did the initial ones. So we're going to see how consistent are these across a, a greater period of time um, as well, just to see uh, how consistent these personality differences truly are. Okay, so we do see that traits are repeatable across trials. This is indicative of personality. Uh, we found interesting sex differences in problem-solving success. 
Um, then we see some weak evidence for some related traits, but this is something that we're looking into further. Um, we, in terms of looking at whether personality really influences problem solving ability, the answer is it doesn't seem to be terribly important yet. Um, but this is something that we're continuing to look into. So we found one result where bolder individuals solve tasks faster than shyer individuals, but that's it. Um, so we're still looking into this further. Okay. Um, what we're doing now to expand upon these results is to ask not just how personality affects individual problem solving success, but given our previous results showing the importance of a pair bond, we're interested in asking whether there are certain compatible personalities. So from the literature, there's, there's ideas that perhaps pairs with similar personalities will do better on certain tasks, and there's other evidence that perhaps actually having a partner with a dissimilar personality to your own can be advantageous in certain situations. And so we're going to look at that experimentally, um, both by looking at um, when individuals are given a choice of who to mate with in a large aviary, if they have free choice of a mate, um, who do they pick? And do they pick a partner with a compatible personality to their own? And um, we're going to look at that in terms of the are the are the mates that they pick is that personality the same type that actually does better on problem solving tasks, especially joint problem solving tasks? Um, there is some evidence that when birds are given free choice in like a large aviary, that they have higher reproductive success with that partner than when they're the typical scenario, which they're presented with one bird, and then that's typically who they mate with. Um, so we're also interested in looking at other behavioral mechanisms that might explain this in terms of synchronization of behavior and uh, coordination on complex tasks. Uh, in addition to um, looking at personality compatibility, we're also looking at relationship duration. So it's possible that a newly formed pair bond uh, may be less successful at combining their behaviors and coordinating with each other than a pair bond that's actually been established for quite some time. We're also manipulating brood success, so a, a pair bond that had a failed brood may be less um, successful at coordinating with their mate than a pair bond that had a raised, successfully raised a brood together, um, so we're going to manipulate that experimentally as well. And then as I mentioned earlier, we're now also looking at vocal communication. Uh, as pairs uh, go through these different maze tasks, how much are they vocalizing with each other, do vocalizations precede movement? Um, and are there any differences in vocalizations between pairs with different personalities and also with different relationship durations? So to do this, we've designed an additional <coughs> maze task. Uh, so we're doing two different types of maze tasks with them. And now we're also doing some social learning work to follow up on this. So here's one um, example where we have some birds that are trained to pull a wire, other birds that are trained to pull out a stopper. And if they both do this, then food falls through, uh, down um, to the ground. And so um, these birds, as I mentioned, zebra finches are somewhat intelligent, but not very intelligent. So these birds took about two months of training to get this, just to pull the wire or to pull the stopper. Um, so we, you can see, I think, just a short video of this here. Sorry, it's hard to see very clearly. So one bird pulled out the wire, the other one pulled out the stopper, and then they get the food. So it took months of daily training to get them to the point where they were reliable enough that we could actually run these tests with them together with their partner. Um, however, interestingly, we've only done, I think, five pairs right now, but we are finding that when we test them in individual tests subsequent to these pair tests, the partner um, is often, has often learned the new solution. So even though it took them months to learn their own solution, uh, watching their partner do the other solution, now they're performing it reliably after just one, um, even just after one exposure. So it, uh, they are getting information socially. Um, we are looking into this further. As I said, we've only done five pairs, but it does seem like there's something there. Um, so we'll see how that comes out compared to uh, control pairs. So with that, uh, I just want to acknowledge the myriad funding sources, the myriad um, people that have been very helpful on these projects, um, all of the permissions I've had um, for my research, and then I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. We do have time for some questions. Yes. Yes, uh, yes uh, this is really interesting program you're doing here, and I'm wondering, um, 
it seems like the structure, which I think everyone is familiar with, you know, developing problems that the birds, in this case, might be able to solve physically and uh, behaviorally and so on, you know, that all comes to us. And I know you had, a, I listened, I tried to listen, and you had a couple of, you know, oh, in the real world. So that's my question, essentially. Like, are you reflecting aspects of reality that these particular species whose sociality you're examining are pertinent to their real world? Or are you, I mean, what is the mix for like human solve the task problems? It, it's not immediately obvious to me that those two are deeply integrated. Okay, um, it's a great question. And yes, we are trying as best we can to give them ecologically relevant problems for the particular species that we're studying. Uh, in this case, with the zebra finches, um, when you think about their natural environments, um, they're in these large flocks, they're in uh, Australia, resources are very ephemeral, and there is um, studies showing basically that they, uh, when there are resources there, the pairs really need to cooperate to access these resources, and then they need to have certain situations in which one member of the pair is foraging to find food while the other one's not, and they need to coordinate their parental care at the nest to have a successful brood. And so we're trying to take that idea and bring it into, admittedly, a very um, human-centric environment. One of the challenges in this field is constantly trying to design tasks that are appropriate for the species and take as much of our sort of um, preconceived notions about what animals should be doing and how we <coughs> view tasks out of it as much as possible. So. With zebra finches, it's challenging to find tasks that they can solve. Um, so as I said, it takes months of training to get them to do something that we view as fairly simple. So the actual experiments that we're giving them, like uh, wire pulling, string pulling, <coughs> things we think that they should be able to do based on nest building, based on foraging techniques that they have. Um, but what we're really trying to get at is this coordination between members of the pair bond. So it, it's very artificial in some ways, but hope it is. We are trying to relate it back to the skills that we think that they should actually have in the natural environment. I hope that answers the question. Other questions? Yeah. Um, how much evidence is there that these uh, personality traits are heritable um, that they can be selected on? Um, there's a there is some evidence that they're heritable um, within zebra finches. I don't. It's a great question. I don't. I can't think of a particular study that's investigated that at this point, although there might be one. Um, so I don't know for these particular traits that we looked at how heritable they are. We haven't run those. We haven't looked, you know, across generations yet within our population, but it, it's a great question. It's something to look at. So my question is related to the previous one. Mm -hmm. So do you know the relatedness of the birds you use? We don't. So these birds, um, were taken, actually some of these birds were borrowed from a lab, another colleague um, in my department also <coughs> studied zebra finches and Bengalese finches, so we borrowed some birds from him. And honestly, most of these zebra finches, um, they've been bred in captivity for so long, you just mail order a bunch of birds and they show up in a box to your lab uh, with zero history. So I don't even know their ages, the new birds that we're getting, I really don't know anything about them. Only once, and this is a fairly new project, so only once we've established this population in our lab, and have like subsequent generations can we know more of that type of very basic information about the birds but I, there might be a fair amount of inbreeding within you know these populations i'm not i'm not sure yeah so actually um, i also want to ask whether age affects the personality and the ability to learn but you say you don't know the age yeah we don't know yet um so we know just that they're adults but we don't know how old they are um so now hopefully we're going to actually have them breeding and so we'll have these younger birds and we can actually look at questions like that. Chuck? Um, a couple of related questions. Do you know the endo endochronological status of the birds that you're assessing the behavior of? Are they fed uh, at libidum or before the tests take place? And do personalities change um, when a pair bond is established based on the relationship between the pair? Yes, so um, for the first question, uh, the endocrinology, we, um, we, we do food deprive these birds, 
So uh, depending on the test, it, the time changes, but uh, we have approval to food deprive them up to four hours, which is a substantial amount of time for little birds. Uh, we try not to do that, if at all possible. We try to keep it to one hour. Um, but yes, they are food deprived for most of these tests. Um, the other question about do personalities change? I think it's a great question, and it's something that we're looking into. So part of the reason why I want to do these subsequent personality assessments is to see if, you can imagine in humans, your partner greatly influences who you become as a person as you grow older together. I don't doubt that the same could be true um, in these birds, that perhaps if they're a pretty shy bird, you know, paired with a very bold bird, that they become bolder over time, or vice versa. Um, so that's something with these subsequent personality assessments that I'm hoping to look at if they're changing over time in a predictable way. Yeah. You mentioned as a future direction, and it sounded really interesting, the relationship between clutch success and then the ability of the pair to coordinate um, in problem solving in the future. Yeah. Uh, it sounded like you were going to be manipulating the, the success of the clutch. Mm -hmm. So um, what, what's the hypothesis there? Is it that if they have a failed clutch, then they begin kind of changing the way that they work, and that happens kind of discordantly? The idea there is that you can imagine um, if they have a failed clutch, that they may become less basically Trusted. Uh, yeah, interested in their partner, or maybe, yeah, there's, there's some <coughs> disharmony there. Um, that may then come out in terms of thinking about behavioral coordination, whereas if they have successfully reared a clutch together, then they might be more in sync with each other. That could be just the, um, the actual, all the behaviors involved with feeding young and all that might produce that. Um, so it's, it's hard to know exactly all the mechanisms in that, so we'll have to work on how to design the proper experiment to really tease all of that apart. But yeah, the idea is that in the wild there are instances where you have failed clutches and the birds move on to a different partner. So we're basically trying to see behaviorally, if you have a failed clutch, does that then uh, negatively affect your coordination with your partner? Yeah. 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 I was thinking about your results of the show, which I thought was really intriguing. Um, like the male, I guess they originally had partners by giving out food, but I was trying to think of any other explanation. One might be if the males are kind of guarding the females while they're foraging, like being vigilant. And so it's more that the females just get the first access to the food and the males looking for predators or whatever. Yeah. It's interesting, but I don't know how that would explain... I can see how that would explain the cucumber experiment, but I don't know how that explains the um, copying of the feeder experiment. Yeah. I have another question about the cucumber chivalry. I was curious if you used a pre-bonded male with um, uh, another female, if that would be a way to circumvent the issues you were having with the familiar cosmetics, or is there extra opportunity? There <coughs> is. It's, it's relatively low compared to other species, but it, it does exist. Um, so we tried it just a couple times, and with males that were in a pair bond with another female, we put them in with this female who they were familiar with but not bonded to, and there was just chasing. <laughs> so, yeah, I, we would love to do that, but I just don't know logistically how to make it work. How to get the males to, you know, not think about certain things for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> a new term for the museum, cucumber chivalry. <laughs> 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 uh, I guess continuing on the theme with the cucumber experiment, so when the pair bonded males or females are actually in the situation foraging, what are, the, what are the interactions look like? So when the male's abstaining from eating the, the cucumber, is he being chased off the cucumber? Like, is there, are there any sort of agonistic interactions, or is the male just kind of um, waiting his turn, or staying vigilant, kind of like what the is getting at? The we mostly found, so they, they, they approach the food on average at the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. If the male approached the food first, he would actually, in 85% of cases, defer. So even though he got there first, he would back off, and the female would feed, uh, and he would just sort of Any last questions? Well, Lane you took off. I was thinking we have to order cucumbers for the, the Christmas party now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's thank Sarah and welcome thank her. You. She may be visiting in the office.